The NSA just called me. We have a problem in East Timor. What kind of problem? A big one. So apparently, people who like Dark Souls 2 are autistic virgins. That's YouTube logic right there, and that's why that is uh, <laughs> fundamentally flawed in an almost egregious way. But asinine nonsense aside, this is Splinter Cell Pandora tomorrow. This is hard difficulty. This is the final mission, LAX International Airport, Los Angeles, California. When can you start? Oh, what an advert. So I don't know if you guys ever saw this in America, because we saw it a fuck ton over here, which doesn't really make any sense considering it's not to do with us. But they were kind of selling California for a while back when uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger was the governor. I'm sure they're still selling it. Uh, I don't know if you had the same advert. I would assume you did. But it was essentially just like a bunch of really attractive people doing nice, pleasant things in the sunshine. <laughs> like there was somebody jogging on the beach, there was a dude roller skating, there were, you know, it was insert generic California esque activity with the sun beaming, everybody smiling with perfect teeth and perfect tans. <laughs> and then the best part at the end. Uh, Arnie came on because he, of course he was the governor and he, and he said when do you start and it was just one of those adverts that it didn't really do anything to sell California to me because I already you know want to go to America I think it looks like an awesome place and I already want to visit a lot of places inside of America because it's also a very big place but just the fact that Arnie's on the advert made me actively hunt the advert out because you know, I am a child of the 80s and I did love me some, some cheesy Arnie films. And then he kind of went away. So just to see him being him, you know, it brought back those great memories. And of course, now he's back doing films, so we can all rejoice that they've not all been completely terrible. <laughs> but I, I just, I don't know, it jumped into my brain. Did you guys in America get that advert? Or was that just something internationally to try and convince us that California is this place where it's always sunny and everybody's trim and there's no obese people and... Yeah, no people with stained teeth or anything. <laughs> but this is LAX. This is a pretty interesting mission. This is one of my favourite missions in this game, if not my favourite. Uh, we're beginning it in a car park after we snuck into that 18-wheeler uh, truck thing in its wagon. It brought us in, and now we're going to continue to sneak into this airport. So this particular level introduces a mechanic which... It immediately trips the imagination of my brain because I think it's amazing and it's so interesting and there's room for this to be something even bigger than what it was in this game. So basically, there are terrorists in this in this airport, you know, controversial. And uh, there's something about the terrorists that I think they've got an elevated uh, heat signature because they've they've been injected with the antibodies against Pandora Tomorrow because Pandora Tomorrow is a nerve agent, I think. Yeah, I could be wrong, guys. It's been a while since I actually recorded this. And basically, which I've now said a dozen times, when you use your infrared, the terrorists will look hotter than the standard employment people. So you're looking through the staff at this airport to find which ones are, you know, undercover and terrorists, and you're taking them out, and you have to kill them. There's, there's no ways around it. You have to kill them. Because they're terrorists, of course. That's what we do to terrorists. So you're going through this public airport and you're you're essentially hunting through these crowds of people to find the guy who's really the enemy. And I just think the idea of that is amazing. And you know if you compared the Splinter Cell with like the, the Hitman Blood Money kind of sandboxy levels where you go in and you kind of scout it and there's all that kind of stuff. Can you imagine a level being a crowded airport? and you're maybe an undercover air marshal or you're some sort of person stopping said terrorists and you had to find who the terrorists were in this crowded airport and stop them while they were actively trying to do their plans a la, you know, Die Hard 2 where you end up going into the luggage compartment when it's on all those conveyors and you see some people acting kind of strange and they start shooting at you and you have a big shootout in the, on the, the conveyors and what have you I just think that would be the fucking coolest level ever or just the coolest idea for something where you're going into alien territory and everyone's a threat. Like, they could even have the, the Left 4 Dead director changing the components of the game every time you played it so that it's different every time. You know, the thing they keep selling all this bullshit. Destiny, it's different every time. Ugh. Like, you know, 
every single game come out is different every time because of the advancements of AI. And what they fucking mean is, you know, they don't have really good memories to remember that it was exactly the same every time. And the only thing that was different is it didn't crash that time, Ubisoft. But just this notion of it being different every time, like you Left 4 Deads with your directors, uh, could be such a fascinating thing. And it could be a whole bunch of different situations. Like, I've been watching a lot of like Siege-esque terrorist takeover X and X person has to stop it because he's the only one who can. So I've been watching a dozen of those kind of movies and just the whole premise of there are people going into this place to do bad things and everybody, well sometimes, a lot of people are unaware that it's going down and there's somebody trying to stop it and Sometimes everyone's aware because, of course, they've got them all the sausages. But it all depends on the setup of the, the story and that. But that as a mechanic, I think, is really interesting. And this is one of the closest I've seen it in a game outside of, you know, like a Hitman level. Because Hitman levels are very, here are your targets. Here's a bunch of people that can get in the way. Try and get rid of them without anybody knowing it was happening. And that's what makes me so sad about Absolution. Absolution had all the technology and none of the charm of the old games. Like... Those old games, for what they had, they made so many amazing situations, and that new one could have been just insanely interesting. And it was still a great game. I don't want to sell that game short, because I still think it's a good game. But it wasn't Blood Money 2, you know? Like, Blood Money, that is such a revolutionary game for me, because it turned everything I loved about Hitman, and it made it work. Because even Contracts, anybody who's played Contracts knows that it's still a janky game. There are still moments where stuff just doesn't work because the AI, because the way the mechanics are, because it's just not as polished as it needed to be, because they've just not figured it out. But Blood Money they did. And it was still clunky, and it was still kind of awkward, but it was also kind of beautiful. And that's what makes it great. And a lot of people have asked me if I'd cover that game, but Blood Money's been done to death on YouTube, and as much as I would like to do it, there's just no real demand for it, guys. You know, there's... There's no real... There's nobody asking for it. And I get people asking for all kinds of different stuff. I was on some forums before I decided to do this project, and there were a lot of people that were stuck on Splinter Cell, and when I did a Google on... A Google? <laughs> when I searched on YouTube to see, you know, if there were any decent videos, there were a handful of, of decent-looking guides that had been made for this game, but none of them had staggering amounts of views. So it's that thing of people who are getting stuck on the game must not be looking for help on YouTube. And you might be thinking, well, if you saw all this information, why did you go through and do this series? Well, I did it because I'd not played these games in years, and I really wanted to. And, of course, the, the first few videos went up and people were really liking them. Hitman, a little bit different. I've played the Hitmans very recently, so there's, there's not as much like nostalgia dragging me back to it because I... You know, I've played them games a lot, and as much as it's fun to, to keep playing the same games, you have to keep moving forward, you can't, you can't just keep doing the same stuff because it stagnates, you know? That was the problem with Dark Souls 2. I got to that point where I just kind of stagnated with the game, and that's why you've not seen anything from it, and you won't see anything from that game until April, when Scholar of the First Sin drops, and I, I check the game out to see what all these new enemy placements are like, and see if it's... You know, anywhere near as interesting as they're making out, because so far, every promise that they've made about that game with these updates and the changes have all been pretty underwhelming, and I'm hoping that Scholar is, is, is really impressive and blows me away, but I don't think it will. You can't just throw a hippo in Forest of Fallen Giants or a, a, a pursuer in the Things Betwixt and, you know, immediately win me over. You have to fix the shit that was in the first game, like, fix the fucking Vestad door where there's not a million guys in front of it. Like, make it interesting. Make it one thing that's interesting. Like, why would they just not put that big red phantom guy that's in front of Executioner's Chariot? Like, get somebody like him in front of it. That way, for the people who want to speedrun, you just bait him out and you run past him and you're fine. Or for the people who actually want an interesting challenge, you've got an NPC that's very dangerous, as opposed to, he has 20 dudes on this huge corridor. Have fun. But there's lots of enemy placements in that game that I think are just horrendous. I think it's completely misconstruing what challenge is and what the Souls formula was. So I'm hoping that they slim it down a little bit and make it more interesting. But 
I just don't think they know how to do that, guys. I really don't. And I think the DLCs proved that because there were parts of that DLC where there were enemies for enemies' sake. And that has never, ever been what those games were about. It just hasn't. Because it's so easy to throw 20 enemies at you in a very short amount of time, in a very claustrophobic corridor, but it doesn't make it good in any way. It's just an idiot's idea of difficulty. And that's why when I watch Bloodborne footage, I get really excited and I sound like a, you know, it's Christmas. Because I see the philosophies that made those early games so great. And a lot of those philosophies were missing from, from Dark Souls 2. Some areas were fine, some areas were perfect, and I think they did a really good job with them. It's just there were other parts that... It makes me wonder, was this somebody completely different who covered this? Because it just didn't work the same. But right now, I'm, I'm isolating people uh, so that I can take out the right terrorists. Now this early phase is all pretty simple stuff. There's not too much strategy I need to tell you here. You've probably got a really good way of doing this. You know, I was just making it up as I was going along just to see if there were any secrets and this was literally one recording. I didn't make that many mistakes on this level. So I'm just watching the paths, watching to see if anything happens, throwing cans, you know, just testing the waters. Is that a can? It looks like a screwdriver when it's... Oh no, it's definitely a can. But I, I'm, I'm not going to say I have high hopes for the Scholar, I just hope. And then Bloodborne's the complete opposite. I have crazy hopes, but I'm not putting any of those into expectations for it, because I don't want to Bloodborne to come out and me be really disappointed with it, and then pissed off for the rest of the year, because I really wanted it to be something beautiful, and it's not. So I'm just going to take it for what it is, and good or bad try and enjoy it and then if it's not as good as I would like and I don't get that replay value that the original Dark Souls gave me, there's always Witcher 3 which looks amazing and I'm super excited for. But that's the weird thing at this moment in time. There are no games on the horizon in my opinion. There just aren't. Like there is that Final Fantasy high definition remake of that PSP game which I think looks really interesting but it's not a new game it's a remake then there's that DMC which is a, a remaster you know like all the games coming in the next few months except for The Witcher and Bloodborne and The Order are all like just blasé if it's not a game that already exists that's been made look prettier and on a different system it's something I have zero interest in. There's literally nothing. There is no killer title for the Xbox One that says buy an Xbox One at all. Like, you look on the games coming out and there's nothing on there that I'm looking at and saying, yeah, that is something that you need this machine for. And conversely, outside of Bloodborne, there's absolutely nothing coming out for the PS4 that makes me think, you know, I need this machine. And I think that that is... I'm not going to say scary, but... It's distressing, I think. And I'm hoping that there's going to be an announcement, like, you know, we've been working on this for three years, and it's coming out, boom, and we just, we've not seen too much about it, and it just drops in our lap. Yeah, of course, Arkham Knight looks amazing. It looks truly amazing, but it's on every system. So you could just as much get a good PC to play that game. You know, you don't have to buy the machines for that. And at this point, they've been out over a year, and they still haven't got that killer app, that killer title. And I think that's kind of crazy. Like, you look at the exclusives on Xbox One. Is it, what, Titanfall? I guess you could count. Sunset Overdrive, which is a great game, but it's not a console seller. Rise? Good fun game, but once again, if you're buying a console for that game, you could just get it on PC. And then what else is there? Halo Master Chief Collection? A game that's sold primarily on nostalgia and the promise of multiplayer, and its servers don't work. <laughs> Good luck there, guys. All the Halo fans, if it's not from fanboyism that are defending that game, they're realising that Bungie fucked them, or 343, or whoever owns it now. It's not Bungie, is it? It's that other company. So, as much as that sounds like an awesome thing, and all those fans could have got something purely beautiful, they're giving them ODST because it doesn't work now. <laughs> it's like, so that's not a reason to buy it. And then on your flip side, on your 
your PlayStation 4, you've, you've got like your little big planets, which I think look boring as tits, but I'm sure there's an audience for that kind of game. Then you have your Killzone Shadows Fall, which looks interesting, but it's still just a first-person shooter in a, a universe that's had a few of them that were never truly top-tier first-person shooters to begin with outside of maybe the first one, which I thought was really good. And then what else do you have? Like... I don't know, I couldn't honestly tell you. There's literally nothing else that jumps out at me on that system. And of course you have The Order coming out, which I was super excited for until I watched a bit of it. And then you have Bloodborne, which is the killer app the PS4 needs, if it's good. So, when you look at it objectively... I say objectively. It's not objective, because there's probably people who are looking at Bloodborne and, and thinking it looks like shit, but... As far as exclusives go, and big exclusives... I think Bloodborne is the biggest. Uh, that is tinged, of course, with some of my own preferences. But when you, if you were to put them side by side at this moment in time, I can see no reason why the PlayStation 4 would not be the console of choice out of the two. Unless you're a PC person, and then none of them appeal. I shot that guy there with the ring air file because he gave me a lot of difficulties getting past him without being seen. So I just went to the uh, easiest path and took him out. But the great news about that attitude for the people who uh, don't understand it and, you know, will inevitably in the, in the comments like, oh, but what about this, this, and this, and this, you know? There's tons of games. Because you always get that. These people who... Like, I've had people defending a console by quoting a third-party title available on every console. Like, that's a fucking bargaining chip. They're... I don't understand fanboyism at all. I understand being a fan of something, and I understand looking at things critically. So the notion of being a fanboy to me just doesn't work. And I've been called a platinum fanboy, which, you know, I don't really understand why anybody could say that, because platinum have made games that are severely lacking in areas, you know. And I will point them out ad nauseum until your brain melts. That's a terrorist, so take him out. And I have no issue doing that. A fanboy is somebody who deludes themselves into thinking that there are no flaws, and that is certainly something that I'm incapable of doing. And when those people leave those comments, I've just started ignoring them, because it just it baffles the mind. But I whistled just then, incredibly loudly, and it gets this guy over here so we can take him out, and it makes moving to the next room a little bit easier. So there you go. But as I was saying, the the good news about the situation right now is there are games scheduled to come out later this year that don't really have solid release dates that aren't probably being talked about that much that might surprise us. And those could be really, really good and we just don't really know too much about them. And this is one of those situations where I want to be proved wrong. I don't want to be sat, you know, without a next-gen console saying the shit. I want to be the guy envious of people who own one and then forced to buy one impulsively. Like, I want to be that guy. It sucks not having, you know, the consoles standing up for themselves. Because at this moment in time, I just don't think they are. They're, they're kind of where the PC was last generation, where PC technology used to be pushed so far forward that the consoles couldn't even compete. And then over the, the last few years, you saw that disparity shift, and you saw it get closer, whereas a lot of the, the highest performing PCs weren't being challenged. Like, they've got all this technology, but the, the devs were focusing on consoles so that the PCs were suffering, and, and nobody was truly pushing them the way that they have in the past. And I'm sure there were people working on that, and I'm sure that there are games out there that are, you know, destroying people's rigs. You know, like your Witchers, like your Crisis used to, like your Metro used to on full specs, these, these things that really gave your rig a hassle. And now you're seeing that shift again, you're seeing PC have a much more direct you know, approach and there's a lot of more people, you know, trying to push it because the consoles have, have caught up and traditionally, you know, PC gaming has always been kind of the pioneer. It's always been on the, the fringe of the new technologies because it's constantly evolving. It's not a piece of hardware that you buy and then it's there for five years. This is something that you can update every month if you can afford to do it because it's constantly reiterating. And Anybody that hates PC gaming needs to really consider where gaming is, because if it weren't for the PC innovations, the consoles wouldn't have half the tech they're using. You know, PC innovates and then forces consoles to try and match it, 
and to try and do it for cheaper, for, for more accessible, for the people who can't be PC gamers because they don't have the tech or the money to do that. It's the convenient option. And all innovations will come via that, so to hate PC gaming is just foolish in my opinion. However, to hate people who pee pee PC... Oh, right there. To hate people who... Pig. No, to hate people who PC game is a legitimate hate because some of those people are the most obnoxious motherfuckers you'll ever meet. But once again, they're fanboys and fanboys are always obnoxious. So, you know, you've just got to go with it. But this room here, I stumbled upon that strategy just then where I thought I could sneak through it without anybody seeing me. That guy started opening those shutters. I went into panic mode and I took out everybody and it worked. So that's one of those really beautiful moments where a panic strategy becomes a legitimate strategy. And I love those moments. But once you push through this door, uh, we're going to be moving towards spotting the bad guy and getting into this elevator. So watch out for the camera just there. And then this next corridor, if you shoot, I say corridor, it's a room. If you shoot out the lights in here, you can completely go past these cameras. I will never, ever forget this room. Because instead of shooting the lights, I was dodging cameras like an idiot. Because I was young and stupid. And I did it. But I remember it being incredibly difficult, so you don't want anything to do with that. Once you've shot those lights out, you want to put your thermals on, and you want to look down here, and you'll notice one of these dudes does not have okay. a right okay. leg. Affirmative. So if you've been paying attention to the story, you'll know who that is, and that's our target. So now we've recognised him, we have to get to him and stop him from setting off the device. And to do that, we're going to be moving uh, into kind of like a, a maintenance area of the airport and then we're going to be doing the final encounter. So open up the elevator. Chances are there's going to be a transition here because the elevators take forever on this game. There's your transition. So the elevator stops and we're going to be going through the emergency exit in the roof. So shoot out the grating, climb up, and now we're going to be doing some some speed, Mission Impossible, Die Hard, whichever film that involved going out of an elevator that you like to, to mention. And there's a little bit of a, a navigation puzzle here. It's nothing too taxing, but it's, it's definitely more taxing than your average climbing through an air vent that this game is all offered us, because there's a couple more options on places to go. But nothing, you know, that's going to stupefy anybody. And I don't know what it is. It must be all the, the cheesy films that I've watched that, that have these moments in them, but I just kind of love moving in elevator shafts. I know realistically it's probably very dull, and when you think about it, it's probably really dirty too. It's one of the things they never capture in films, because of course it's a set, it's not in fact elevator shafts for most of them. Like air vents, and air ducts. A lot of those ducts are probably really dirty and grimy, and you never get that true sense of that stuff uh, when you watch films, because... Ooh, that made a lot of noise. This is really not normal. Somebody's in the lift, poor buggers. But... Doesn't matter. Climb out this hole, and this is where the finale kicks off. So this is kind of tricky, but I've got a really good path for you here. And if you get lucky with the pattern, you can take out all three terrorists with one spray of a sticky camera. However, uh, on this successful run, I wasn't able to do that. I, was, I got two people, and then I sticky shock of the third guy. But move to your right, climb up this ladder. From this ladder, you want to be pushing forward, and from here, this is where we're going to make the shot. So, save, put on your sticky camera, and then stick a, oh sorry, your diversion camera, and then stick a diversion camera on that central pillory thing. You'll notice I'm looking for, for surfaces here to see if I can sneakily get up, and I don't think I can, I have to go around. But there are a couple of civilians that make this more awkward, so instead, I'm going to go with the diversion camera. So stick it on that piece of concrete there. If you were a little quicker than I am, you should be able to do this and get all of them. Because I've done it myself. I just wasn't recording at the time. Or you can time it and get good. Or you can like pivot it and get good. But it didn't align the way I wanted. So I ended up having to kind of just go for it. So there goes those two guys. As soon as you interact with them, the timer starts. Or maybe that's just him touching the, the bomb and it started the timer. And then sticky shock at him. And then you've done it. All you need to do now is get up to where they were, kill all three of them, and then defuse the machine. Uh, the sieves don't really matter here. I'm just going to clop them to get out of the way because they make you clip. 
and then you climb up here and then from here you climb up there and just be aware of the time because if you're taking your time here you, you could be in trouble as soon as it gets to zero you, you will be in trouble so just be aware of that drop down onto the catwalk and then from here I'm going to disarm the bomb and this is when I realize that I have to kill the guys so I'm going to turn around and I'm going to double tap them so sorry you can't defuse the bomb until they're dead so I uh, put the pistol on and I start Leon in the professional in them there's one there's two and then the last one there we go there goes the timer and then we can defuse the bomb and that's the end of Pandora tomorrow folks on hard and we're gonna get a ton of trophies which you're gonna see pop at the end so we just got go fubar whatever the hell that is I assume it's for killing these these people here then we just got neutral outlook I think that's no alarms that one I might be wrong but there's kind of a, a, an exposition dump here because they're worried about what they're going to do with this device. So once Lambert and Fisher have stopped speaking, it's going to skip to mission complete and then it's going to show you a cutscene which I've trimmed out. And then we'll see in the results uh, what we get at the end. So duty calls is one of them, which might be for beating it on hard. Trophies take a while to pop as well, I've noticed. Then there's Veteran, which that's probably for beating it on hard. Duty Calls might be for beating the level. Phantom Strike, I believe that is for never being seen. Immune is for not using med kits. There's a gold trophy. 5-7, uh, I think, is for not using a secondary fire on Ghost Don't Die. That's for doing it in under three deaths, I think. Like... I think the 5.7 is because I didn't fire my F2000, but there you go, folks. A whole stack of trophies and another splinter cell under your belt. Thank you very much for watching. You take care now.